I can't believe it's been 20 years since <laughs> Nirmar Johnson was at Cincinnati. And by the look of what he's wearing, he's got so much pride for that Bearcat program. And we're so glad to have you, Jermar, on the podcast. I'm Brian Fenley with Fox Sports Radio. I see the shrine behind you. I see the Bearcat hat. Mm-hmm. How about those roots in Cincinnati? When you think about that one year you were there, what stands out to you? Where can you go back and say, man, I feel good about that? Just just the relationships I've made um, while I was there. Because like now you see me wearing the gear. I'm back living in Cincinnati, right? But when I left school, I didn't come back here for a long time. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know I had so much love here until I came back and all the, the fans, people who noticed me and just were excited to see me. And I'm like, you know, they, they really show me a lot of love here. And I, I didn't realize how much playing for a, a, t- a place school means to them. Jermar, a six overall draft pick in 2000 by the Atlanta Hawks, one season at Cincinnati, Conference USA Freshman of the Year. How did you end up playing some high school ball in Maine? <laughs> so, 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 so what happened was, um, I was, I was, they really wanted to get me away from home so okay. I can really just, just focus on basketball and no distractions. I was supposed to be the top player in the country and I was supposed to come right out of high school. I wasn't even going to go to college. Yeah. So that main year was supposed to be my, my college year. And that coach was a really tough coach. He'd get on me and push me to my limits and, and that was kind of the plan to go there and have him push you and, you know, take away all the, the, the critics of saying you're not playing hard or whatever they got to say and going there, you, you have no choice but to play hard. So that's how that ended up happening. You play in the McDonald's all American game. And I saw a documentary that was done on you on YouTube. And you talked about how being part of the McDonald's all American game also gave you a little bit more of a perspective on what you wanted to do next as far as do you go pro right out of high school yeah. and then college. Ultimately, what were all the factors that played into you going to Cincinnati for that one year? Okay, so the plan had been to go straight to the um, NBA. Like nobody around me or even probably in, in college thought I would ever see a day of college. So what happened was in the McDonald's game, Jonathan Bender, had a killer game, ended up breaking Jordan's record, getting like 30 or something, 31 or something. And he took a lot of momentum with him. He was 6'10", 6'11", shooting threes. So now it was like, okay, no, Ben is going to come out. He just he just killed in the McDonald's game. So for me, it was like, I could have still came out and, mm-hmm. and still would have probably, you know, been a lottery pick maybe. But the people around me were just like, just go to school a year and, you know, get stronger because you don't, you deserve to be a top pick. You're too talented to, you know, come out and, and not go as high as you deserve to go. So I just, I was really listening to the people around me, Curtis Malone and um, Sonny Bacurl. What's Bob Huggins like away from the camera? <laughs> um, he's a big teddy bear. When, <laughs> once, <laughs> once practice starts and once the game time comes, it, it's like a, a click. He, yeah, he, he's he, he's on you after that. He's he's cussing you out. He's on you pretty hard. Refs and all that. He's on you with dead after the game and all that. He's he's hugging you, man. I love you, and all. and he's a he's he's a lovable guy. Aside from that, do you have one memory that you two shared in a game that describes your relationship, where perhaps you were feeling down about something you did on the court, and he was right there, and he said. You got this. Hang in there. Just a moment where he was there to console you when you needed a coach to step in and lift your spirits. Nah, I never had that moment really. I mean, we were so good. And I'm just always so cool and chill. Yeah. I never I never had that moment. We uh, we lost a few games, but we it was it was pretty much riding high all year. And you know, I, I knew I was gonna be done after one year. But what the thing with him is, is everybody on the team got into a screaming match with him, except me. Really? Like, yeah, because he when he gets on you, he allows you to give it back to him. 
So wow. guys cuss, yeah, guys cuss back at him. They talk back to him. You can't win. You'll lose every time. <laughs> but he, he 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 invites that. But me, I'm too cool. Like you cuss at me, call me any kind of skinny, soft, anything you want. I'm just okay. Cool. like, okay, coach, cool. <laughs> you got it. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. And your way of handling that probably served you best, right? Probably so. That's just the way I, way I am. And like yeah. I say, when you when you know you're a one and done, you know you out here the next year. <laughs> and it just I'm I'm just a cool person anyway. I didn't have to you know yell and scream. I mean I know I can't win that battle. Sure. How much hair did Mick Cronin have in 2000 when he was an assistant? <laughs> because I do a little bit of work at UCLA, and that whole staff that he's assembled along with him, none of them have hair. None. <laughs> oh, he had a lot of <laughs> he hair. He had none at that age in 2000? Oh, no, no. He had a lot of hair back then. He did? But okay. Was, before he went to UCLA, part of me coming back to Cincinnati is, is I was um, – when I went back to school to finish, I joined the staff. So That's right. I was like, none of these guys have hair. And even another co- – it was it's two other coaches that was here with them that, that isn't there with them. They didn't have hair either. <laughs> like, so he just hired more guys with no hair. I feel like that's part of the resume when it comes to him. And he probably does so much in making fun of himself for that. You were on the staff. What was that? 2017, you were on the staff? Yeah. yeah How did the invitation so come? How did Mick Cronin reach out to you? And take us through what that experience was like. So I, I, I finally came back to school, like, for homecoming 2016. Mm-hmm. And I haven't been back since they did a hugs roast. Wow. Um, me, me, me and Kenyon, we, we, we went back to homecoming. That's where I was getting the love from people. Oh my God, Damar, Damar. And, um, and Mick was like, um, I, want, I want to talk to you, so I'm going to call yeah. you tomorrow. So he, he, he hit me up and he was like, um, I want you to um, you know, want you to consider coming back here and finishing school and helping me with the guys. So I'm like, okay, let me think about it. I'm still playing at this time. I'm playing overseas. And I'm like, all right, like, what does it pay? He was like, it doesn't pay anything because you, you, you're you still in school. You got to sure. finish school. So I'm like, all right. So then I just thought about it. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to take the sacrifice. I'm going to leave my family. I'm going to go back to Cincinnati, and go to school and coach and get that experience and, you know, be able to get my degree. And I've been here ever since. I saw that documentary on you on YouTube and it had a lot of great footage of you during graduation and the ceremony. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you had mentioned in that video that like getting that degree and and going to college and finishing that out, just how challenging that was knowing where you came from. When you look back at what you had to go through to get the degree, but also you being open about where you're from and how hard that is, Mm -hmm. how does that make you feel? Feel great, man, and it wasn't easy at all. Um, I was I was going to school all year round. While um, I got to be at practice every day. Then in the summer, I'm taking five classes in the summer while I'm playing in the big three. It was like it was it was nonstop. And but once I got in a groove of it, became a little more easier. But it was it was a tough road. But I knew I was here to finish this time. When the first time I came. I knew I wasn't here to stay, so I didn't really, you know, take it take it as serious. I had to almost start over because I didn't even finish that one year. Jamar Johnson joins us, former first round draft pick of the Atlanta Hawks, sixth overall in 2000. I'm Brian Fenley. If you told yourself, Jamar, in 2000, when you passed up your last three years of college, and you said that one day you were actually going to get your degree. The 2000 version of yourself, what would you say to yourself now? Um, as, as far as thinking at that time. Yeah, I'm that you would get finish. that degree and, and because you had your mind obviously on the NBA. Well, well, I knew it was, it was a, a possibility that I can, I can finish. Because even the NBA, they give, you, they give you classes that you can take while you're playing. And I, I started one of those early, but then I stopped that quick. I'm like, I'm trying to focus on my career. And me thinking I will actually come back to Cincinnati and being in and being these classes, I, I would have never imagined it. Wow. 
wow. I'm like, I want, I want to be a, I want to be a, a pro basketball player. I'm going to be an NBA for 20 years is, is what I'm thinking yeah. at that time. And what I'm, what I'm going to need a degree for. Yeah. Well, exactly. And when you were playing that one year, I'm sure with all the traveling you did and with basketball on your mind, I mean, mm-hmm. class is class basketball for you must've been a lot more important. So I mean, how much class would you try to get in? I know you talked about not finishing all the units that you wanted to, but mm-hmm. what's it like when you, you're so dedicated to basketball? I'm sure that, mm-hmm. that, that the last thing on your mind is books and school when you know where you're destined right. to go. Right. So I just took the classes that they told me to take, really. And, and our, my fr- the freshman, our year, we had, we had to go to class. Like, hugs, hugs was, was on us about it. We had a guy follow us to class every day. We oh, hated wow. Him. Yeah, like, Kenyon and them guys, we didn't see them on campus. I don't know how much they went, but <laughs> <laughs> the freshman, a guy was hired to follow us to class. Wow. And if we missed it, we're, we're, running, we're running football stairs in the morning. So, hugs was, was really on us about, about wow. going to class while we were there. But after we lost in a tournament, that's when I just I, I left school. It was over for me at that point. How soon after that loss in the tournament did you know? All right, I'm not even going to ponder it. I love Cincinnati, but my mm-hmm. time is up here. Yeah, it, I, I, everyone everyone knew that. It was going into it. It was like a, a one year deal for me. Sure. Now I, I've always said though, had had Kenyon had had another year. I wouldn't have mind coming back because that team should have won the national championship. So I felt like we, we had a chance, but Kenyon was a senior. He was done. I, I knew I was going to be a top, a top pick. I was out of here. How often do you go back to that season and think what could have been? All the time. Yeah. Uh, especially being, especially being here in Cincinnati, like everywhere, every time I'm out, I, I, I've been hearing it for the last three years is, you, that's probably why everybody remember me so much. It's like that was that team that they feel like was the best team we've had in Cincinnati. And that was a team that it's almost like we we won it for them. Like if Kenya don't get hurt, we're gonna win it. So we're taking that championship. What was the first thing that went through your mind when you saw Kenyon get hurt? I didn't know it, I didn't know how bad it was. Yeah. It was just I mean guys, you know, fall all the time, maybe a sprained ankle. I, I didn't know how how bad it was then when I seen him cut his Jordan shoe. <laughs> I know he was pissed about that. He, he just got those, and once they cut into that shoe, I'm like, "Oh man, it's it's bad." And it's at a bad time in the year. We we're about to get ready for the tournament, and he was so important to us. I, it took a lot out of the whole team. For you to have him on the court, and, and to say to look back in retrospect and think what it would have been like if he was healthy, how definitive? are you that you, that team would have won the national championship? I mean, if you had a percentage, because it, it has to be way up there. Yeah, I, sure. I don't know the percentage. I, I feel, I don't think there's a doubt yeah. that we um, win that national championship. Like, Michigan State was really good. I feel like we, we, we beat them guys. We know if Kalina was in the, in the final four that year, and we beat them pretty easy that, that year, and they made it to the final four. I feel like we, 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 I mean, because, we we were talented, talented freshmen, talented seniors. Kenya was the best player in the country, and and we were tough and skilled. What was it like playing with him? You two playing off each other and just feeling how dominant both of you were. It was fun to watch because when I first come in here, Kenya wasn't a scorer his junior year, so I'm like, oh okay, yeah, I'm gonna have to do a lot of the scoring. Me and Kenny Satterfield were coming in as McDonald's All Americans. I'm thinking I'm gonna have to you know, score 20. And I didn't because the Kenyan I saw when I got here was a dominant guy. He was, couldn't be stopped in a post. He's hitting jump shots and turnarounds. And he just got so much better every game. I didn't, I didn't need to, I didn't need to do nothing. I mean, low under 13 points a game was, I mean, was, was good enough for us to keep winning games. How much of a rock star did you feel? Like over that one year when you were at Cincinnati, when was there a moment to you where you felt the most like a rock star? All the hype, all the attention, all the TV cameras, and mm-hmm. all these people telling you how good you are and how promising your future is. For me, for me, that happened long before Cincinnati. That was that happened as a like a, a sophomore where I was regarded as, you know, one of the best players in the country as a sophomore. 
and maybe the best player in the country as a junior. So I had ESPN, when I'm with the main ESPN cameras was up there following me, doing, doing the story on me, following me to class and practice. Um, in Cincinnati, it just followed because we were the number one team. Our, our games, kids were sleeping, sleeping out to try to, you know, get in the student section yeah. for, for our games, like the, the night before. Like we're, we're going to the line to see our friends that's standing in line waiting to get in for the game that's the next day. And all our games were jam-packed and we, we, we were rock stars. We still are here and we haven't played in a long time. Yeah, and it, it shows that you you come back to school, you come back to the city, and you're so well received. You are like an idol that will live on forever in Cincinnati lore. I heard this quote from Michael Sweetney, former you know Georgetown NBA guy. He told Vice Sports, he says, "quote I tell people you were Kevin Durant." Before Kevin Durant, mm -hmm. do you agree with that? Um, I hear it all the time. Um, we we have we have a lot of similarities. Um, I was supposed I felt like I was supposed to be everything that he became. If you know, if it wasn't for my accident and I had those opportunities, but yeah, six nine guy crossing guys up, shooting threes, just doing all the the the, the skill skill stuff. You know, for guys outside, people at home always compare us. When you look at your pro career, your NBA career, mm -hmm. how does it sit with you? Um, I, I go up and down with it because I mean, I'm, I'm so positive. I'm like, just to even a chance that being NBA sure. is, 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 a, is a blessing, something that not many people get, get the chance to. But then it's also like, I was, I was, I feel like I was, a good enough, way better player than a lot of people who got a chance to see. Had you know, and I had my accident. I was going in, in the the right traje trajectory to you know be a star one day, and then after that, it was just like trying to hang on. So it's like, man, I'm seeing all these guys who I kill, and they having you know way better careers, and, and like, and my friends and people know it too. They're like, man, you you way better than this guy, way better than this guy. So I don't know. I feel like I should have been a perennial all star but also could have never came back from accident. I could have, you know, never made it to the NBA. So I'm blessed either way. You, you spoke about hanging on and you did. Mm -hmm. While you weren't the player you were beforehand mm -hmm. with that accident, you played several more years in the NBA and you played several different teams with several different teams overseas. Mm -hmm. You did not want to give up the game despite the fact that you knew that the accident made you a player that wasn't to your potential, why did you hold on to your love of basketball for so long and keep pushing and playing professionally, even if that made it where you had to go overseas or you had to go to the ABA or wherever? Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's what I love to do. It's what I still love to do. I don't, I don't, I, some guys like don't even like play in the summer guys in NBA, like, they they don't they don't even love the game, but they just big and you know they, and they and they want the money. Exactly, it pays play. well. Yeah, right. I love to play. So <sighs> when I when I was after my accident, when my um, people were like man, you want to just take this insurance money and retire? I'm like hell no. I'm I'm going to fight back and I'm going to keep playing and and that's what I did. I still I still have my abilities. I was still able to run up and down the court and fly through the air and shoot and dribble and stuff, but I just never was looked at the same by everyone else. I never got the opportunity like before. Before they were looking at me as this guy's going to be the franchise now. I was like, uh, you know, we'll, we'll grab him and shoot some threes in the corner, play some defense. What were NBA executives telling you going into draft night about where they could use you, the talents you had, because here you are, I'm assuming you're still a teenager at that point, and you're being told how amazing you are. And yeah, we all would have an ego to that, but at the same time, you're trying to take in everything they're saying and realize that you haven't even stepped onto the court in the NBA yet. Right, well, they, they never really talked to me and tell me how they want to use me. And my agent did most of the talking to the GMs. Um, but going into Atlanta, I did think I was gonna um, have to be used a lot more than than, than I 
than I was. Their plan was, what they told me after I was drafted was, they wanted to bring me along slowly. Sort of like how Toronto did McGrady, sure. how, the, how the Lakers did with Kobe. And they wanted me, they seen that formula and wanted me to, you know, do me the same way. Me personally, I didn't, I wanted to play right away. Guys, that was in my draft class. They was thrown out there to play and make their mistakes and they're getting minutes. And that's what I wanted to do. But they had their plan for me. And right when it was supposed to take off, that's when the car accident happened. The day you were drafted, do you remember that day? Like a timeline from moment you woke up to being drafted? No, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> like, like, how did you handle it with all the nerves and the anticipation of such a momentous day for you? I'm, I'm just always so cool. And it was, so it's funny, the draft day for me, I was happy once I, I always, I'll always have that moment of, shaking David Stern's hand and being drafted. And, but for me, it, it was like, finally. Because I knew since I was a sophomore, I was going to be an NBA. But for a guy like Kenyon, you see Kenyon's crying when, when he got picked. He wasn't a top high school player. He was a senior. He had to work his ass off to get to that point. He's the number one pick. So for him, it was probably the most emotional day he's had. But for me, it's like, OK, cool. I'm going to Atlanta. Now let's, <laughs> let's play basketball. What is the best advice or the best encouraging words that Kenyon ever told you, whether it was when you two were playing together at Cincinnati, or maybe it was after your accident, you guys were close. He offered a word of encouragement, something to uplift you. That is just something you remember from him that helps you along the way. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. We never, I don't really think we even had them kind of conversations because I'm just not, I'm I'm not that guy. I'm not a guy whose head is down and sure. I'm looking I'm looking for people to give me advice and stuff like that. I'm everything I deal with, I deal with internally and I just, you know, I deal with it pretty well. So but I but one thing I'll never forget is when after my accident, how he had his shoes, he had my name stitched in all his oh. shoes from, from, from Reebok and that was that was special. What also must have been special is knowing that when you were drafted, that you were able to fulfill a promise to your mom that you got to the league, you told her that many years before, and then you were able to buy her a home. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine, Dermar, what that must have felt like for her. Could you take me to her headspace when she saw her son see his dreams through and then you were able to provide for her in such a a wonderful way you know my mom my mom is all even the littlest things my mom is, is proud of me about um to be able to take care of her and most of a big family that i have it was it was it was great because we didn't have things growing up and now we're able to you know give basically anything we want and you know a lot of my family just you know, coming with me and being able to enjoy the ride I was on. It was just, you know, a blessing for me, for all of them to be proud of where we come from and where I made it to. How much are you still playing, Dermar? How much are you coaching? When we get back to normalcy here and basketball mm -hmm. is full on, where will we see you? Because I know you are going to have your fingerprints all over the game. Right. So, well, still playing in the big three. It got it got pushed back next summer from sure. the COVID stuff. Um, I just played in a three on three tournament similar to the Big Three. We called the the five tournament just last last weekend. Um, oh yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, yeah. Was How good. was that? It, it, it was it was really good. So, so the Big Three ish. We was in a okay. in, our, in our little bubble. Um, Ex NBA guys playing three on three. It was like a smaller scale of the Big Three, but it was it was good. It was good. It was fun. And, and, and then, also. I'm Oh, sorry. sorry. Go for it. Yeah. So, and I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get, get on the staff. I'm trying to, you know, be in the front office or scout or coach. I, the plan, well, I thought the plan was after I graduated, I was going to, you know, get on the bench with, with Mick. And then he took the UCLA job. But yeah. I guess since I have hair, it's probably why he didn't bring me with him to, <laughs> to, to LA. <laughs> Speaking of Mick at UCLA, if there ever was a moment where he needed somebody, I know he would go to you. You would definitely be a front runner. When you look at what he's done at UCLA, why do you know deep in your heart that you're 100% certain that this guy is going to get the job done? 
because you've been around him, you've seen what he's done, and have all the confidence that he'll be able to do that at UCLA. Listen, man, that guy takes that job serious. Like, he, the whole time I was here, like, I didn't, we never, like, hung out or did anything. That guy's home watching film. Wow. Like, even, like, not, every other coach is scouts, and he already know, like, he's watching their scouts, and he already know what's going on with these teams, and this dude takes his job, like, like, serious. He's all basketball. Like, he played golf, maybe some in the off season, but he's a, he's a smart guy. He knows, he knows his stuff very well. One of the most prepared teams we, we are. Um, we were when, when I was there in Cincinnati when he was there. So I know UCLA, they're definitely prepared for their opponent. And that guy just knows his stuff, man. Wow. I could say the same thing about you. I feel like you're describing yourself, the characteristics of being prepared, loving the game wholeheartedly, doing whatever for the passion of basketball. Jermar, this has been a pleasure to reminisce a bit on your career, talk some hoops, and I'm glad you're doing well. I can't wait to see what happens next for you in basketball. You're going to get on a staff. You're going to play the big three. And I just love how you continue to stay so close to the game. And does it even feel like it's been 20 years since you were right. 20? Where did those 20 years go? <laughs> they fly, man. They, them years go by super fast. I tell all, I tell all the young guys, it's going to go by fast. Enjoy it.